when I look back now, I was 19 years old. I mean, Jesus, I can't imagine my son at war. It was a very kinetic environment and you were constantly at an elevated state of alertness. Any education you get is just so that it gives them a different way to torture you and drop the hammer and see if you've got what it takes. I remember that moment of crawling and thinking, I'm gonna die, I've gotta get out of it. I have to change my lifestyle, I've got to go. Today, I asked the question from five military veterans, what's the one story that taught you the most out of the military? We hear from experiences at war to life-changing injuries from people like Billy Billingham, Mark Ormrod, Clint Emerson, and so many others. These stories hold some extremely valuable lessons. Today's video was sponsored by Mullingbrothers.com, where you can now get the Not A Journal with the link in the description, ready for 2023. So many of you guys have been buying them in preparation to plan for the year 2023, and we just want to say a massive thank you, but also there are only a limited supply, so get them now whilst you can. But before that, let's jump into five amazing stories from five absolutely amazing people. I'm your host, Jordan Mulligan. Let's dive into the video. I couldn't understand what I was learning at school. You know, crossing the T's, dotting the I's, all that sort of stuff didn't make any sense to me. And while I was in the cadets at the age of 11, this, I was being taught first aid, how to navigate. And that made sense to me. I could see how that was going to be used in my life. So I kind of, and wrongly now I know that, I disbanded school and at the age of 13 I got, I got expelled from school for gluing the maths teacher to the chair thinking it was clever and it captured me put me in detention and was determined I was going to do deter, uh, detention and was two floors up and he was in the room with me keeping me there and as soon as he went to the door to do something I opened the window and jumped out into the bushes and ran off and then at the age of 15 you know I ended up in a fight and uh, I got stabbed yeah, um, and it was at the time of the skinheads, the rockers, the punks, all this sort of mixed craziness going on and violence was getting worse, knives. Gangs were meeting up and slashing each other with um, cut throats and, not, and it, it was getting violent. And then it, I ended up in a fight. <clears throat> I got stabbed literally about 100 metres from my house. And I remember crawling back to the house. And as I was crawling, I was sort of going in and out and it, it, it went from pain to sort of as if I was drunk, I was like floating and realising it's because the blood was leaving my body and I was about to collapse, you know. And I remember crawling through the door, blood everywhere, and seeing my mum cleaning. She saw me and screamed. And the next thing I remember, she put this um, woolly jumper on, directly on the wound and that woke me up again. I was like, ah! You know, but I remember that moment of crawling and thinking, I'm going to die. I've got to get out of it. I have to change my lifestyle. So I've got to go. I knew that's where I wanted to go. I wasn't sure exactly where in the military I wanted to go, but I knew the military was going to be my saving grace. And it turned out to be that a bit later on in life. And I eventually joined uh, just after 17, and when I joined the Panachute Regiment. And that's when my whole life changed then. You know, I realised I'd done the right thing. I knew this is where I needed to be. And I was now looking at real men, not little troublemakers from where I was, that I thought was a big fish and I wasn't. These were real men been to war just after the Falklands, respected, and, that, and I remember looking and thinking, that's who I want to be. I want to re be remembered and respected for something good like these people. And that was my, I've got to do this moment. When I made it to the Special Forces ODA, I got um, fortunate to go to a special unit within Special Operations. And um, that first deployment was to Iraq, and we were part of a task force that was hunting Zarqawi who was the number one bad guy in Iraq and the number two bad guy on the planet behind Bin Laden. You know, we had 200 and something combat operations in this deployment as we're hunting this guy, Zarqawi, and none of us got hurt. No, I mean, it was just like overwhelming power of expertise and professionalism. And when you look at special missions units, like, you know, the SEAL Team 6 and Delta Force, um, when all of those efforts are pointed at a singular entity, like that, that focus, that, and the, all the modalities that they've perfected, like all of that energy is like acute to this tiny little uh, point, it is nothing can stop it. And that, that's, that's what I was part of, the first deployment. It's pretty rad to be part of that. The next deployment, it's me and my sniper partner going to Afghanistan to be part of a, we were USASOC snipers, US Special Operations Command snipers. And we weren't there with 
a team. We are just two snipers that we're going to go support all of our coalition partners. So we have the Czech, the French, the British, all of their special operations, uh, you know, the, the SAS or the Canadian Special Forces, each of those units as they would go out, we would be this like uplift, like a bolt on extra thing. My partner, um, when he got on the ground, he found out that his wife had been waiting for him to leave and she had drained their bank account and was selling all their stuff. So uh, when he got there, his life is kind of a wreck. So they pull him off and I end up by myself. Um, so I start doing all these missions with all these different coalition partners as a lone American. So I'm with, I go to Erzgan with the Czech Special Forces and while we're there, we get blown up in an ambush that turns into a three-day gunfight where we're able to fight our way to Firebase Anaconda, which is a pretty fa famous firebase because it was overrun by the Taliban multiple times. And uh, while we're there as a sniper, I mean, it is just, it is war. And, and war is the worst things that human can, humans can do to other humans. And um, like there's a, there's a moment where I'm like covered in my, my own shit because we got blown up and I got overpressure. It's like, like brain injury. We're at altitude because we're trying to, we're going through these big, huge mountains where we're ambushed. Hadn't slept in a couple of days. I know how, I no longer have any bullets and I'm on my belly trying to figure out where, what dead body I can crawl to to find bullets. Like it was that kind of bad time. So very different experiences in war. Um, the Taliban, just as brutal as Al Qaeda, um, but in the rural, um, austere environments of Afghanistan, that brutality is, is extra horrific. Oh, it's just a weird acute. You know, they um, throw an acid on little girls because they didn't think girls should go to school. Um, you know, the torture was normal to the Taliban as, as a way to show that they owned a village. Um, and that was, so Afghanistan and Iraq for me were very different things. Um, and those were my first two trips overseas to war in special forces. Very different. Getting out there, you know, Northern Ireland, um, the, first, the first couple of nights in, um, we were on a quick reaction force. So anything that happened in the region, we would jump on a helicopter, go straight out there, deal with it. And um, I was, when I look back now, I was 19 years old. I mean, geez, I can't imagine my son at war. You know, it's just like, I can't believe I was that young. And um, that first night we got in, something had happened, a bomb had gone off, we were straight onto the helicopter, straight out, and um, the, IRA, the IRA had uh, driven a, a, a truck bomb or a car bomb into a checkpoint. Totally obliterated the whole of the checkpoint, it was a 500 pound bomb. And the, off, the offcoming guard, which was the cold stream guards, that it killed about five or six. But I can always remember we got down on the ground and one of our sergeants got out, Sergeant Clare, and he was like, um, he'd been to the Falklands, he was pretty, you know, hardened and those kind of things. We were still in a state of shock. There was just mayhem everywhere. And um, I can remember he gathered, gathered everyone in and he booted something on the floor. He said, we need to see if we can find any more of these. And we looked down and it rolled. And as it stopped, it was a head inside a helmet. You know what I mean? That was like, my first introduction as a young boy to war, that's where I crossed that bridge. And it was a bit of a shock, really. A hell of a shock, actually. Um, and then we had a pretty, after that, you know, we had a pretty colorful, they tried 19 times to kill us. Um, didn't succeed, but um, it, was, it was an interesting tour. But one thing I did learn on that, which kind of changed my view, and I think this was really, when I look at it, it was the catalyst for me wanting to join the Special Forces. I can remember looking across the ground one day and I don't know why I had it, it was just like an epiphany, it was just like something that came into my head. And they used to give us all these sort of tasks, all these missions every day to go and do. And I sat there one day and I went, there are no tasks, there are no missions, we're bait. And that's, to this day, I still believe that, you know, we're bait. We're being put on the ground because they want the IRA to attack us and then from that, that's where they build their intelligence. You know, the activity creates the intelligence picture. So for me, it was like, I just thought I'm just cannon fodder. Basic underwater demolition seal training, or BUDS for short, is the selection process for Navy SEALs. And it is literally just six months of getting your ass kicked, being kept cold, wet, and sandy, 
uh, and never really having an opportunity to rest. And the focus is first very much physical, which ends up turning into a mental game. Uh, and then that just continues with a little bit of education, uh, but really not. Any education you get is just so that it gives them a different way to torture you and drop the hammer and see if you've got what it takes. But ultimately it is six months of hell to see if you can endure what gets thrown at you, be, see if you're mentally strong enough to deal with, you know, crisis and complicated scenarios and then uh, and see if you're just uh, just see if you're good enough to be a part of that brotherhood I mean six months is a long time when every day you're getting your ass handed to you um, I think for me where I had the most anxiety was when it was pull comp which is a week of uh, underwater stress tests right you're on these old Jacques Cousteau rigs, twin 180s on your back, double hose regulator, old school systems. Um, and they do that on purpose because you can pull that out and tie these big whammy knots in the hoses while you're going back and forth along the bottom, right? And while you're going back and forth, you don't know when the attack is coming, but it's coming. And you just keep going back and forth instructors are up there circling like sharks and they're waiting for the right time and that right time for them is when you exhale and all those bubbles come out then those guys come down and they literally beat you underwater take away your air immediately pull your mask off your face tie the hose in a knot loosen your shoulder straps, chest strap, waist strap, take your weight belt off, it falls immediately onto the bottom of the combat training tank, toss you around, slap you in the head, and then now you have to start solving your problems in a orderly fashion. Because if you get out of order, you fail. So you have no air, and now you have to start putting everything on in a specific order, right? So then you're, you've got your mask and you're getting everything, you're kind of collecting it up to include your fins. And now you've got to take your rig, put it on over, put your arms through the straps, get your chest strap done. You've untied a knot that's in your rig, of course. You get air. Now you can clear your mask, put your fins on. Anyway, you go through the whole process and then you just start going back and forth across the bottom again. And you... Meanwhile, they're up there circling like sharks, and then they wait until you exhale again, and they come down and do it again. And they do it to you over and over and over again to see if you're gonna quit, to see if you'll boat, bolt to the surface, because if you take off to the surface, that's considered quitting. In Afghanistan, as soon as you hit the ground, you hit the ground running. And um, you could be fighting at all different hours of the day, two, three o'clock in the morning, it doesn't matter you know, night, day, all throughout the year. It's, it's a very, it was a very kinetic environment and you were constantly at an elevated state of alertness. We were called up to the headquarters compound. It was Christmas Eve, 2007. We were called up to the headquarters compound and we were given a brief on a foot patrol that we were gonna go on. Something we'd done a million times before in the three months that we'd been there. We went back to our compound as normal started preparing all of our kit and equipment as normal. And then we went back up to the headquarters compound. We formed up by the rear entrance of our camp in two sections and we got ready to leave. Now the idea of this patrol was that we would have two sections with eight men in each section. We'd leave the rear entrance of camp. One section would go north, one would go south. We got told to patrol the immediate perimeter of the camp, pushing no more than 300 meters out. And then the two sections would meet at the front entrance of the camp, so now the opposite side, secure the location, close things down, and finish up for the day. Now my section, we're on a high piece of ground, what we call the North Fort. Now because we're in an elevated position, tactically we're in a very advantageous position because we can see everything around us, and it's a lot easier to fight going down a hill than it is up. So we're up on the high feature, and the section commander took his half of the section and started giving them fire positions. I took my half of the section, 
And about four meters in front of me, there was a shallow bowl in the ground. Now normally what you would do, if you go farm on a patrol, if you stop, you would take cover behind a building, a wall, a tree, a rock, whatever you can find to give yourself protection and, and cover. But we're on a high feature. And I saw this bowl and thought, okay, if we get in there, we get down on our stomachs, you're not gonna be able to see us. It's gonna be very difficult to attack us. This is the best form of protection that we can have given the environment that we're in. So I jumped in, the other half of the section started taking up their fire positions. When they were happy, they gave me the thumbs up. I had a, a couple of last minute checks I had to run through. And then when I was happy, I slowly started walking over towards the position that I selected for myself. And as I went to get down to my stomach, I put my right knee on the floor. And that was the moment that I knelt on and detonated an improvised explosive device. So you have to imagine the terrain that we're working in, right? It's very, very sandy, very, very dusty. So when this IED detonated, this huge dust cloud was created and I couldn't see anything. And I was in no pain. And I could hear all the guys around me shouting and screaming, trying to figure out what had gone on. And my gut instinct was that we had been attacked. I thought someone had fired a rocket or a mortar in our position. It had exploded nearby, which is why this dust cloud was created. And instantly I was thinking, find out where the attack came from, neutralize the threat and get everybody out safely. Everything inside is going at a thousand mile an hour, but everything outside is in slow motion while you're trying to figure this out. And you know, the way your body reacts is, is crazy. The way it just goes into like self-preservation mode. But despite you know, the severity of my injuries, both legs, my right arm was, was torn off, it was still attached, but everything was just shredded inside. Despite the severity of my injuries, this crater that I was in, I read the report, it was now 12 feet deep by 15 feet around. There were six other devices around me. Despite all of that, like I said earlier, those men that I was working with were so professional and good at what they did. I never really thought that I wouldn't make it out of there. I don't know how they got me off this high feature because I had my eyes closed, but they got me out of this crater, off this high feature to where our vehicle was waiting. He starts climbing up this hill to go into the front entrance of the camp and he's got to go left and right because of the terrain. And the medic fell out the back. I fell out the back. The guy driving swung around, reached out to grab me to hold me in. He grabbed the femur bone that was coming out my right leg kind of held me, my tailbone is on the, the back end of the vehicle, the tailgate, got me back into the camp, got me to the helicopter landing site. And the last thing I remember is this Chinook coming into land, this huge sandstorm that it creates from the propeller blades, the exhaust, the heat from the exhaust beating down on me in the back of this vehicle. And then like the mechanical noise of the tailgate dropping and then I, I blacked out at that point. Initially, I wasn't in a good place. You know, I was 24 years old. I was at that time six foot two, 16 stone, physically, I think at, at my peak. And then I woke up in hospital and I'm like four foot three. Because of losing three limbs and the, the infections I was fighting off, I was probably eight stone 11, I think. And full of tubes and everything. And I also had a, a huge hole in my hand from a shrapnel wound, I could only use two fingers. And was just lying in bed, thinking, that's all I could do. And initially, I was not in a good place. But, I had incredible support around me. You know, from my family, from the Royal Marines, all the doctors, nurses, surgeons, everyone around me, just kind of came together to, to get me through those initial couple of weeks of, of dark thoughts and hardship. And it worked out, you know, it worked out in the end. Thank you so much to Clint Emerson, to uh, Aldo Kane, to Billy Billingham, to Mark Ormrod, to Tim Kennedy. I think I got everybody. I'm gonna put their links in the description. These guys have been through so many experiences in lives, they put their lives at risk to protect us 
And in those situations, they learn so much. And these guys have come away and decided they want to share those stories with us. So the resources are down below. Go follow them. Take the lessons that you find applicable to yourselves. You know, not all of us are going to be in these situations that these guys are in. How can I apply some of this to business? Clint was one of the guys who taught me a lot. Uh, Tim Kennedy taught me so much. I mean, all these guys did. The, and, and the biggest story of all is resilience. These guys all had resilience. And I love that. That's exactly what we need to become successful in life, in entrepreneurship, in sports, whatever it is. Resilience is a huge thing. And then my favorite of all is discipline. The amount of discipline these guys have, the routines that these guys have, they applied that to business and they are super, super successful. All of these guys are in their own right, outside of the military, are super successful guys. So yeah, go follow them, take the lessons. Which one was your favorite story? Comment down below. Um, today's video was brought to us by Mullenbrus.com where you can now get the Not A Journal ready for 2023. They are flying off. We only have a limited supply. I've reserved about five of them for myself. So there's only a few left. So go check them out. The link in the description. All the profits go back into making this content possible. We are interviewing a lot of people right now. So keep your eyes peeled by hitting the notification bell, subscribing, and think about coming a channel member with the link in the description. Uh, but guys, thank you for watching. Have a blessed and productive day. If you made it this far in the video, do me a favor. You are part of the Inspire Change movement. Go and comment down below, Inspire Change. Have a blessed and productive day. Follow me on Instagram at Jordan Mulligan, and I'll see you in the next one. Peace.